Kia ora everyone, it's the last episode of the New Zealand Quilt Show before Symposium in Christchurch next week starting October the 5th. Who else is excited? I know I am and I'm pretty sure that there's other excited people too because Facebook, everyone um, is packing and finding their supplies and, and there's a countdown on the Benina page and Instagram actually, this is this is a good one for those who Instagram. There is a hashtag started by Adrian from on the windy side. It's called the hashtag is I'm going to symposium and um, I know we all hate taking photos of ourselves, but it is a, a you take a selfie, you um, include the hashtag and basically what you're doing is introducing yourself to other quilters who are going to symposium so that we can put uh, names to faces and perhaps introduce ourselves to some of our Instagram friends who we've never met in person before. So join in if you are going to symposium and you are on Instagram. Okay, also if you're going to symposium and you are wandering around any of the exhibitions and you see me, please come up and chat to me, especially if you have work hanging in the exhibition. I'd love to uh, maybe do a short interview with you about your work that you have hanging. It wouldn't be anything too intimidating. I just think it's really important that we share our stories and that we get uh, a real range of of work and a real range of people and um, value our skills and, and, and encourage each other by um, by sharing about our work to each other. So I will have a talk to me badge on and I want to say thanks to Anna for suggesting that. Um, I found a couple of exhibitions for you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're not going to, if you're not going to symposium, there's a couple of exhibitions that you could perhaps amuse yourself with if you're in Auckland. There is Project Hexagon, which is a group show at the Nathan Homestead Gallery uh, that's running from the 23rd of September to the 28th of October. And there is another one called Exploring Friendship, and that's by a couple of West Auckland quilters, Margaret Chapman and Vicky Bradley. And that's on from the 6th of October to the 10th of October. So that's perfect if you're feeling the lack of, of um, symposium joy. And that is on at the Barrel Store at Corbin Estates Art Centre in Henderson. So I am madly packing and I'm trying to get all my supplies together. There's a couple of, I've got a couple of weird items um, on my class list, I'm doing a class with Jane Dunawald and Judy Coates Perez, and I'm looking forward to both of them. But I'm hoping to get my last supplies tomorrow. Um, I've also got a pattern that my Aotearoa tote bag pattern, which has been really popular with um, anyone who's seen it. It works on the positive and negative applique style and it's a it's a it's a it's a really neat little bag very um very convenient nothing too hard like it doesn't have a whole lot of fixtures and things that I know intimidate people but it's got beautiful New Zealand themed applique and that will be on sale um, at Kerry from Tulis Textiles stand at Symposium along with um, and you can see the mock-up of the um, the sample that I have there for you, um, done in her beautiful batik fabrics, and it and it uses, it works great with batik fabrics, and of course Kerry will have all her fabrics for sale at Symposium. And the last thing I want to say before I introduce my really really cool guest is that uh, the last quilt of the Pacific Stars mystery quilt that I've been running in conjunction with Carol from Carol's Quilts. The final qu uh, clue comes out tomorrow um, on the Carol's Quilts website and you get to see the final layout of that too. So all the clues will still be up for a while so that you can... Um, you can join in if you haven't started and you like the look of the final layout and want to join in. 
Right, so my guest today is Gloria Lofman, who is an incredibly well-known Australian art quilter who makes the most divine landscape, and um, recently she's been doing architecturally-based quilts. She is so lovely to talk to, really generous with her time. She's so incredibly busy, and she worked really hard to be able to fit um, a chat with me into her schedule, and I really appreciate it. So, without further ado, um, let's talk to Gloria, and I will see you on the other side of Symposium, hopefully with a whole bunch of really exciting interviews. Kakite. Welcome everybody to the New Zealand Quilt Show. This is my last episode before Symposium starts and I'm really glad to have Gloria Lofman joining me today. So Gloria, Gloria's a quilt artist who lives in Victoria, Australia and she began patchwork about 30 years ago during recovery from chemotherapy for breast cancer. Gloria studied for a diploma in art in 1996 and then began to make her large colour and light filled landscape quilts that she is most well known for. Gloria has won many awards, including the Raja Teaching Award in 2009 and the most prestigious Australian National Award for her quilt, Kimberly Mystique, in 2003. Gloria is a trained secondary teacher and has taught her art quilting classes for many years. She travels to teach extensively with more than 20 countries under her belt. Gloria is also the author of four art quilting books and the most recent one on architecture and house facades has just been released. She has a craftsy class, has had many solo exhibitions and will be teaching in New Zealand at the National Quilt Symposium next week. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you. So, Gloria, 30 years ago you started patchworking. Did you ever dream that it would become your passion and your career? No, certainly not. Um, It did start as a therapy when I was uh, still recovering from having chemotherapy um, and surgery for breast cancer, and a friend invited me to the local quilting group. We lived in a a small country town, and I really went for the fellowship and the friendship of the other quilt members. And um, at that stage, I was a fairly keen sewer uh, with three daughters. I'd made lots of um, children's dresses and then later on formal um, dresses. But I went along to that patchwork um, group really just for the company. And uh, so I started uh, my first quilt was quite a large project in that it was a queen size quilt that had was made up of two blocks and um, and three different colored fabrics. I can't imagine now making a quilt in only three different <laughs> fabrics, but uh, away I went and I um, I learnt to rotary cut, which I loved. I um, put that quilt top together. I sandwiched it and I started hand quilting. And I'm ashamed to tell you, it actually never got finished. I don't think that that is entirely unusual. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's quite a few first quilts still sitting in cupboards. That's for sure. A, a few years ago, um, the Victorian quilters asked me, uh, whether I could have an exhibition at their showcase. And um, it was to be from first quilt to last quilt. So I, I tried to find that first quilt and I knew that one of our daughters had it. Um, and the tacking is still in place and it was actually in her dog kennel. So <gasps> my, my exhibition was from second quilt to last quilt. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> So, Gloria, you, you you mentioned that you had a sewing background. Is that is that why you felt comfortable going along to a patchwork class? Because you could have chosen any sort of class, like a painting or mosaics or ceramics, but but you were going for the friendship and the companionship. So, did you choose something that you would feel comfortable doing? Yes, I think I did. Um, I I didn't start sewing until after I was married. 
and um, but I felt quite confident using the sewing machine. My uh, hand um, handwork is non-existent at the moment. I hand stitch down my bindings, but other than that, I don't do any handwork on my quilts, and I definitely don't hand quilt them. But I did feel confident using the sewing machine. It's interesting. The other the other passion that developed about that time was uh, a passion for gardening as well. So. I think, um, you know, I was quite fragile and I just needed to have something to occupy me that was creative and uh, and both of those certainly filled that need. Gentle arts. Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, in my background is that I was a teacher of physical education and mathematics originally and I've always been a very physical person that liked to... Um, play lots of sport and when I had the breast cancer I was still in my 30s and still very fit and and playing lots of sport and I guess the gardening and, and the quilting were a, a big contrast with that and they certainly um, occupied my thoughts and um, you know and they were a, a, a nice gentle challenge for me. Mm, yeah so um, your husband has said that the biggest mistake he ever made was buying you a banana sewing machine 30 years ago. Why does he say that that's his biggest mistake? Well, it's certainly a tongue-in-cheek thing. Um, when we were first married and we were both teaching, um, it, it was one Christmas time, and it's actually over 40 years now because <laughs> it's just after the birth of our second daughter, and um, he talked to the needlework teacher at school where he was teaching and he thought he might buy me a sewing machine as a special surprise. And uh, and it was a surprise. And, and at the time, I thought it was okay, but, you know, I didn't actually sew. So <laughs> uh, anyway, um, over the years then, you know, I, I got that machine out and I like to experiment with it and use all of those embroidery stitches that were on the machine. And uh, uh, most of my early quilts, um, right up until about 97, most of my quilts were made on that banana, which I still have. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, um, it's always been a joke that he actually bought it for me. He didn't know what he was buying and it just started off this whole, the ball rolling and this amazing journey that we've been on. Yeah. So really it wasn't a mistake. It was a serendipity moment. Absolutely. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. He he's, he likes to joke about it, but um, <laughs> yes, we both enjoy what we do. <laughs> so your first quilt never made it to a bed, it made it to a dog kennel. What was your second quilt and your third quilt? Um, my second quilt was in, uh, it was sort of an Amish style. We had um, some teachers come up to Kerrang where we lived, which is up near Swan Hill, and um, a teacher came up and showed us how to make an Amish style uh, quilt. It was a wall hanging. And um, once again, you know, choose three or four colours. So most of my early quilts were geometric, uh, a minimum of, of, of fabrics. And at that time, I was still teaching at school. And uh, so, you know, this is what I did in, uh, for enjoyment in my time off. Um, I don't think I um, made uh, a landscape quilt until much later in the process. So my early quilts were mainly geometric, um, traditional quilts. I made quilts for all our beds, quilts to uh, send away with our daughters as they left home to go to university, uh, a quilt for my mum and dad's uh, 45th wedding anniversary, I can just remember making all those traditional quilts and then I started getting a bit frustrated because uh, I didn't know anything about colour or design. Um, my experiences at art at school uh, were not very positive mm. and that's when I decided to enrol in that Diploma of Art. Yeah, so you studied for a Diploma in Art in 1996 and and so that was a bit of a turning point for you. Absolutely. Um, I'd gone in my own study. Um, I'd gone back to university and I had studied special education. 
So I was a, a special needs teacher at school um, and I had one day off a week and I enrolled in this diploma of art that was a, a, a course for uh, textile students and you could do it by distance education. And so um, while I was working on the diploma, I didn't have any time for quilt making. So there was a period of time there when I was working on that, working on the uh, assignments that came through each week. And um, it was when I finished that that I made my first big landscape quilt, and it, that, which was based on one of the exercises that I had done doing that course. And that kind of just led you, once you'd made that sort of first step into those landscapes and things, could you ever see yourself going back or was it just a continually step forward and step forward on with the next quilt discovery almost? So, um, you know, it, it has been a journey over the years. Um, my uh, first big landscape quilt was really a problem-solving exercise i have done a very sort of um, simple painting of the scene and it was somewhere where we'd been camping in Queensland. And as I made that quilt, I was, you know, how am I going to do the sky? Well, well, I, I can paint it and I didn't even have fabric paint and living in a country town didn't have access to any. But I just made it up as I went along and there are a lot of things wrong with that quilt that I can see now. Um, there's a seam right in the middle of the sky. Um, I didn't really create the perspective very well. So I've learned a lot um, since then um, about making landscape quilts, but unbelievably that quilt went on to win a very major award in Japan. Mm. And it was like, well, was, it, was that a fluke? Can I keep creating these um, landscape quilts? So um, I was still teaching at school, so each year I tried to make one big landscape quilt and each time I tried to add something extra. So whether it was the machine embroidery, um, some painting, um, some thicker thread work, um, multiple images in, in one design, I was pushing myself each year um, to make that big landscape quilt um, it's still learning and, and, and it's still a journey. That journey continues till today. Do you think um, the fact that you started with, with only focusing on sort of one large work per year, that that gave you a chance to really refine your, your look and your style, but without, without pushing yourself to, to produce quantity yes yes I think it I think it did and also because um, my time was very limited and um, and I knew that I wanted to exhibit that quilt so I was always always striving for excellence I guess when I was making that quilt and I would redo sections also because my time was limited um, I quite enjoyed working on one big project and, you know, all my focus was on that project. Um, so looking back, I think that was an important part of the um, process for me. And it also meant I developed my own style, I think, during mm -hmm. that time. Um, it, and it's interesting, I hadn't thought about that before, but I think you're right. I think that was really helpful, just focusing on that large design. Mm, interesting. So, yeah, you started with landscapes, and, and over time your work has evolved to include uh, like landscapes with a tiled background appearance, and then you've included uh, quilts with contour lines of your landscape. Um, and then now your work is including a lot of architecture, but I can still see... Gloria Lofman in your work. So can you tell us a little bit more about sort of that evolving process, but how you've managed to keep your your, your sort of voice through these different subjects? Because I presume you're making more than one quilt a year now. <laughs> yes, I am making more than one quilt a year um, because I'm making um, quilts for books and quilts for classes and quilts for myself. 
And it is really interesting. I, I look back, the big landscape um, quilts that I made, um, they had lots of sort of colour wash, lots of squares sewn together, diamonds sewn together. And then I still, I think with my maths background, I still really love pattern. So I was trying to include pattern in my landscape quilt. So we had um, the quilt uh, with the boab trees in where it had lots of pattern, mm. um, the trees and recognisable shapes. And, um, and I still, you know, enjoyed actually sewing blocks together. It might have been a nine patch block or individual um, squares, sewing them together to create areas. And then after um, doing the, the patterns in the landscape, I then had a period of time um, where I did uh, quite a few quilts that were just pattern, were quite abstract. Um, some of them had a landscape feel about them. Some had some trees in. So they were, they were quite abstract. And, um, and as I was um, working on the book Quilted Symphony, which has a lot of those um, quilts in it, I was playing around with tiling, tiling different areas. And uh, all of a sudden, it was a light bulb moment. Um, wow, I could use that for a sky. And so then the whole range of tiled quilts evolved. Um, I think what the, um, the, the focus for um, including the architecture is that our eldest daughter, uh, who was a, an engineer, in her 40s, went back to university and studied architecture. And um, I was sort of surrounded by what she was doing. Um, we often looked after her three children while she was studying. I used to read her books and, and I discovered that I had a, a, a deep love of, of architecture. And, um, and so began the period of making the quilts based on um, of buildings. And um, I am still in that phase at the moment. I've got two things happening. I'm, I'm still making quilts with buildings, mm -hmm. um, but I'm also back playing with the landscape again. So um, I think probably from now on, these will be the two areas that I will focus on. Yeah, I see, um, I see the connection between all of your quilts with light and colour, they're, they're themes that run strongly through your work. And I found this quote on your website Underlying all my work is a passion for colour and the ongoing challenge to capture light in my work. So, so why is that so important to you? Um, I think especially capturing light, um, it's such a wonderful component. I think it's the most important component. And it turns something from being sort of, you know, a, a nice quilt or a nice painting to being something really special. And, you know, it is an elusive thing and I'm always chasing it. I find that in my landscapes, um, I can work at incorporating the light when I'm using lots and lots of fabrics in the background to incorporate the light shining through. And then I've got to try and capture that uh, in the foliage. Um, and I've studied lots and lots of paintings to see um, how different artists capture that light. And to, for me, it's just the magical element. It's just the thing that brings the whole work alive. And I think that is going to be something that I will be striving for forever because I really believe that that's the most important element. Um, as far as colour goes, um, I love everything to do with colour. And I actually have three different classes that I teach on colour. And um, I love vibrant colours. I love murky colours. And uh, to me, um, just even getting the fabrics out and planning what I'm going to use, I'm excited before I've even started cutting by just looking at all the fabrics piled up together, all the different colours and textures. I love dyeing fabric. I even like ironing the dyed <laughs> fabric because it's, it's all looking at the colours, how they all move together. So um, I think that will be um, my aim forever is to, you know, the richness of the colours and then the play of light. I think that's that's just so crucial to to make a work uh, really stand out and be appealing. Mm, what's that, um, that saying that 
light and dark do all the work but colour gets the glory? Yes, that's. I think that's very, uh, very true. And, um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's good. I hadn't heard that before, <laughs> but I think that's really uh, very, um, very important, yes. Yeah. Now, you said that you do a lot of dyeing, and I know you paint some of your fabrics that you work with. So why do you find it necessary to create your own fabrics? Um, I Initially, we lived up in Kerrang, and um, I didn't have access to fabric. Um, I had to drive, you know, maybe 120 kilometres to a quilt shop or to a really good one. I had to drive about 300 kilometres. And so... Um, in the beginning, it was sort of just so that I had the resources I need. But I find that painting a fabric, I can create something um, that, you know, the colours are where I want them to be. The value is, is, you know, what I want to work with. And it is unique. And uh, in some of my latest work, I'm actually um, doing quite a lot of painting and then of skies and foregrounds and water and then cutting it up into quite small pieces and reorganising it again. And, I mean, it's just unique when you paint the fabric yourself. Um, dyeing the fabric, I love the intensity of the, the dyed fabric. And once again, um, initially I dyed it for myself, but I also dye it and take it to classes for people to use. And um, I just love the richness and the way the colours mix together, the serendipity of it, you know, the unexpected things that happen. Mm. But I do use commercial fabrics as well. I, I use quite a lot of batik fabrics in my tile quilts because it tends not to fray. Mm. Um, the painted fabric certainly doesn't fray because I've gummed it all up with paint. Um, and I also really love um, the fabric that comes from the Annecy Village fabrics in Africa. Um, they print on damask, and so there's light and dark in the fabric already, and that's um, a fabric that I can't get enough of. So uh, that's a special one for sure. So have you got any tips for uh, quilters wanting to try painting their own fabrics? Well, I think you've just got to let go and, and think, well, you're not going to create a masterpiece. It's almost like back to your childhood. And you're just painting a piece of fabric, which you let dry and then you iron it. Um, if you don't like it, it doesn't work. You paint another one. You just, you know, fold this one up, put it in the drawer, put it away. It'll come in handy one day. I think if you if you can just relax and get that paint on there, uh, for a sky, really all you need to do is make it uh, lighter at the bottom and darker as it goes up and it will read as the sky no matter what else happens. Um, and some of the best pieces that I've seen painted have been painted by kids because they're not frightened of it and they just get in there um, remembering that you'll probably cut it up to use it anyway. So I think if you could just relax and slap it on, um, I paint with quite a big foam brush and um, I'm much more uh, relaxed and do a better job when I use a bigger brush right. so that works for me great so so relax slap it on don't worry about it too much and if it's really ugly cut it up small absolutely perfect <laughs> yes <laughs> so how did you get into teaching well um, I was a secondary school teacher for oh, over 30 years and um, I think I'd been making my big landscape quilts uh, for about four or five years um, when I was invited to teach my techniques at a conference in Victoria. Up until that time, uh, with a friend, um, we were teaching a basic patchwork course in our little country town. I was so nervous that um, about teaching you know, outside my sort of area, outside my special ed or my maths area, um, that we had two of us for 12 students and we ran uh, a six-week course that um, participants came to in the evening and we did beginner patchwork. And when I was asked to teach um, my landscapes for the first time, I was really nervous and I certainly over-prepared and off I went to teach um, that first landscape class. And then gradually I got uh, more invitations to teach. 
and uh, one that came out of the blue was teaching a class in Japan and um, I'd entered some of my quilts there and the organisers wrote to me to see whether I could come and teach. So that was pretty amazing in the early days. Um, I also came over to New Zealand to teach at some of the uh, symposiums around the year 2000, 2001. And um, I think, you know, I, I take my teaching skills for granted because it's just what I've done for the last 30 years. But, um, you know, applying them to a different subject area, it's been really rewarding for me. I was asked to teach uh, fairly frequently around the year 2000, 2001. And uh, by that stage, our youngest daughter had left home to go to university. And so I decided that I would uh, resign from school quite a few years earlier than I had planned and see how I went teaching quilting. And I can remember talking to our accountant and, you know, asking him, you know, his opinion. And he said to me, why would you give up a $50,000 a year job for craft? <laughs> and, uh, I was quite sort of daunted by this and then talking it over with my husband and after having the breast cancer, it sort of changed the way we felt about things. So initially I took a one year's leave without pay so that I could go back to school if things didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And they did work out and I resigned from school and now have been teaching quilt making full time for 16 years. So, uh, and it has been full time. It's uh, I've been very busy, but yeah. we've uh, we've had a wonderful time. Because you, you've taught now in at least uh, 20 different countries, and I was looking at your recent schedule. It's included Australia, Korea, Norway, California at empty spools, Scotland, and a cruise in Alaska. So. So what are the challenges of teaching in some of those different countries? And, and do you find students of different cultures work differently or need a different te teaching technique? Um, it is different in different countries. And, of course, if you are somewhere where um, the students don't speak English, there's a different pace in the class. So in South Korea, I had uh, a lovely girl translating for me. So you have to think about what you say and be precise um, and everything takes a little bit longer. Uh, in the early, oh, in 2001 through to about 2007, 2008, I did a lot of teaching in Europe as one of our daughters lived over there. So every chance that I had to get to Europe, I went for it. <laughs> and so quite often I had to have um, my classes translated. It's quite tiring. You are quite tired at the end of the day. But um, in South Korea, the students were so enthusiastic. They laughed a lot. Obviously, in the translation, some funny things happened. But um, it's just, you know, you still proceed the same way. You just try and be more precise. You do a lot of hand actions and um, maybe limit the subject matter a little bit more. Um, it is different teaching in different countries. Um, as you've probably heard, the, the Kiwi quilters are the fastest of anyone in the world. Oh, and, really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> followed by the Australians. <laughs> um, and uh, often, you know, I'll get my quilts out when I'm in England and I'm about to head off to England in another two weeks' time. And I'll get the quilts out and I'll go, oh, wow, we love the colours, but I don't think I could use the colours that bright. So different places, the colours mm. are different. Um, and the pace that people work um, in class is different. Mm. But um, it is all so rewarding. I love being with small, you know, small guilds out in the middle of nowhere that are so appreciative of, of you coming and then you get the amazing lunches at those places with all the country <laughs> cooking. Yeah. Um, and then to teach at somewhere like Empty Spools in America where the students have flown uh, from Canada all over America, sometimes from Australia, New Zealand, to do five-day workshops with you. And so uh, the five-day workshops 
uh, the students work all day and half the night. It's quite um, it's quite a grueling process for them. They they have to be fit to to get through the week. They have highs and lows, so you do do it differently. Um, a one day class somewhere to a five day class that that is really different. But um, I think. When I left school, I thought I would really miss my, my kids from school, especially my special needs kids. But in actual fact, teaching uh, quilt making has certainly um, filled that, um, that niche. And it is something that I really, really love doing. Yeah, what is it about teaching a class? Because it is hard work. I mean, all the travel and all the organisation and all the, you know, you're putting in your heart and soul to to these classes and as you say at the end of the day no matter whether it's in Korea or Australia you're tired so what is it that keeps you coming back? I think it's just that feeling um, seeing the students at the end of the class um, just seeing how they are so excited about what they've created most of my classes um, students design their own quilts and often they come in not very confident, quite nervous and worried. And um, just to see how happy they are and how confident they are, to get the emails afterwards, photos of the quilts, um, what they've gone on to make, uh, for me that is so rewarding. It just makes it all worthwhile. I also enjoy all the different cultures. Um, working with different groups of people. Um, I find it really, really rewarding. And um, I know that some of my contemporaries now are finishing teaching. They want more studio time. They're tired of travelling and they've been on the road for a long time. But I actually can't imagine stopping myself. Um, I can see that I will cut back, cut back, cut back and try and just have more time at home. But um, it gives me such a buzz to actually teach and to see, um, you know, how people are feeling about their work at the end of the uh, workshop. Mm. To set that little bit of um, giving back. To, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yes. So how do you stay relevant in teaching? Because there's so much, there's so many classes and workshops and books and online resources. So... Are you constantly having to come up with new classes or do you do you just sort of try and te teach concepts rather than techniques so that it's always relevant? Um, I think because it's a journey for me in my own work, I'm all, always thinking of, of things that I can try. And, um, and then I think, well, you know, I could teach this. So for me, I'm not trying to come up with new things to teach. I'm working on things uh, for myself. Um, okay, at the moment I've been playing with um, strips of fabric and placing them horizontally in landscapes, but then it came to me, well, what if I put them on an angle or um, what if I move them up and down? So it's sort of like me playing with ideas in my own work and then after that thinking, well, yes, I could offer this as a class. Um, I, I still get requests for some of my really old classes that I've taken off my website because um, there's a limit to how many you can offer and um, I, for my own sake, uh, sanity's sake, I need to, you know, be doing new things with people in class. But it's not that I think I've got to have a new class. It's more with, um, okay, I can share this technique with people. So it's more um, my own work is developing and then me using that to, um, to uh, you know, make up a class and to offer to other people. Maybe that's why your classes are so successful, Gloria, is because you are doing the work for yourself. Rather than looking for something to teach to others, you are, are looking for something for yourself and then you, once you've explored it fully, then you pass it on to others. Yes, I, th I think that's true. And I think then I really enjoy watching then in class what other people do with it. And I, I, I haven't done a class with a teacher myself since the early 90s. 
but I learn so much from my students and see, you know, ideas evolve as they explore the process as well. So um, I think that's true. I think I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing for myself and I enjoy teaching. And so the two things have just naturally gone together and it hasn't been, okay, you've got to come up with something new. I've never, I've never had that thought uh, for teaching um, that I've got to come up with something new. It's more like, I need more time to explore <laughs> what I'm doing yeah. rather than, you know, thinking about coming up with a class as such. Yeah, yeah. So you're also an author talking about time. And so how did the process for you of writing your first book happen and amongst all your teaching and travelling and things? Well, uh, I was teaching at empty schools in America and some of the um, staff from c &T, the publishing company, um, usually try to visit the empty spill seminars to check out what people are teaching. And um, there were a couple of the uh, editors from c &T, uh, approached me when I was teaching a landscape class there about writing a book on landscapes. So uh, I didn't have a clue what to do, but, um, in, you know, they gave me the information and I had to put in a proposal, which was a huge job in itself. Um, you've got to, the hardest thing is to write um, what's actually the list of things that are going to be in the book, like the index, um, and, um, and you have to write the whole chapter, you have to do a project with all the um, diagrams and photographs. So to actually do the proposal is a huge job, um, especially the table of contents, actually thinking through what's going to be in the book and the progression. Mm. So uh, I handed that in and didn't hear anything for ages. And then all of a sudden it was sort of like, yes, and can you have it ready by a certain date? <laughs> we had to negotiate that. Um, and so the first book was um, a, a huge learning process for me. Uh, my husband bought a new digital camera and uh, there was me on my laptop. We lived in, uh, in Kerrang then, and away I went. Um, and that book, Luminous Landscapes, has um, it's been a, a huge success for me. It's a book that sort of put my name out there. Mm. And I found that I loved every minute of writing it. Um, I didn't like the deadlines. You know, I get stressed about the deadlines, but my husband stays all nice and calm and uh, he get me over the line. And he also has very good computer skills and is a person that is always organised. And so, you know, he, he would keep me organised and, and keep me calm as we work through the process. And because um, we used all his photographs and he did the photography of the quilts, it's a wonderful project to work on together. Mm -hmm. uh, he's retired and so um, after the first book was such a success and uh, they approached me about doing another book, uh, he was very keen to do it. And so, you know, now book four is out and book four, based on um, buildings, uh, has a lot of his photographs of, of some amazing places around the world that we've been lucky enough to travel to. Um, all those years of teaching my special needs kids um, instructional writing <laughs> came in very handy. Ah. So I think there's one more book to go. I think I'll do one more book um, back to the landscape again. But um, it is a process. I love working on it as long as there's time. It's just always the time element, which is the same for everybody, I'm sure. Yeah. Can, can you tell us about that book that's just been released? Yes, well, it, um, it's, it's called Fabulous Facades, and most of the facades in there are buildings. Um, I especially love all the old buildings that tell a story, you know, all the, the funny textures and the, um, the clashing paint colours and the way that people have fixed buildings up with sort of really... Um, <laughs> Sort of products you never think of, you know, bricking up windows and things like that. And then I also love all the the modern buildings, so, which are, you know, almost gravity-defying buildings. Um, so the book is based on um, using a, a building um, as your starting point. It may be a close-up of a section of a building or it might 
include some background if you need to show the setting. But then it also goes on to, um, there's a chapter about other facades. So I made a quilt of a container ship with all the containers on. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of students in my classes, in the facades classes, have made uh, quilts with old trucks and tractors and uh, camper vans and caravans. And so it doesn't have to be a building. It, it's just a process that you can work through to create, um, you know, a, a, a quilt based on a facade. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit different is that um, I, all the main sections of the building or the, the camper van or whatever are outlined with a fine black line or a dark line. And it's just part of the process for me is that uh, each of the um, the components of the building are broken down into different sections and constructed separately on a dark piece of batik back, of background fabric. And then when it's all applicated together at the end, that fabric is trimmed right back. So there's just a little eighth of an inch of that dark fabric around the main shapes and I've left that in there. So it's a little bit like a, a woodblock print or a lino print where you've got that uh, black line appearing around the main shapes. It's quite a graphic sort of appearance, isn't it? Yes, it is. It does. It does give a graphic feel to the work. And it also means because you've broken it down into those different sections, um, you can actually do a really good job of the stitching because you're only stitching small pieces and um, before you put it back together again. And then it's a bit like building a house after that. <laughs> you, you start with the background and then gradually add the pieces, you know, and the details in, in, at the end. So uh, it's quite satisfying. There's a lot of work to get to the part where you actually put it together. But um, that part happens very quickly. And it, as I said, it's quite satisfying. Uh, you know, as that end product sort of emerges uh, on your quilt top. Mm. That graphic line that you're talking about, when you have your tiled backgrounds in some of your landscape quilts and then you have your linear landscapes, they have elements of that graphic outline yes, look as well. Yes, that's right. And I think if you look back over my work, um, it, it's all sort of related. So we had the tiles where we had the line in between the tiles, and then we went on to the um, to the the landscape with the contoured landscape, the linear landscape with the with the lines in there as well. And this is just really taking that a step further mm -hmm. and using the facades instead of the hills. So um, it is all quite related. And what I'm working on now is sort of related to the tiles, except bigger shapes and. I, you know, as I keep saying, it is a journey and I just keep adding something else or saying, what if I did it this way? Um, so they are, I think all my techniques are, you know, very sort of related to each other. Yeah. You're working in a series in a way. I guess I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you teach and you travel and you write and you make art and you talked before about time you that you kind of wish you had more so how do you find a balance between creating new art you say that you've got a new body of work that you're working on the moment and maintaining such a busy schedule um it does become a bit of a juggling act um and this week we've just had five days away with our family uh sort of family is so important and spending time um, with our grandchildren, with our, with our daughters and their husbands. So that's really precious. And sometimes I just have to mark off time that I'm just not available. Um, I try and be home as much as I can in the school holidays to help out with, with kids. I've got three very um, supportive daughters and um, they, um, they really are very positive about what we do, about the way we travel. But um, it is it is a, a balancing act. I think when I'm home, I have a I do have a lovely big studio, and I can be in the studio from when I get up in the morning till midnight at night. And um, so I guess um, I have to use my time well when I'm home. I'm always thinking about about designs. So I'm sketching as I'm going along, and I think when I get home, I hit the ground running. Mm. I try and be efficient. Um, but sometimes you do have to just 
have time to experiment and make mistakes. Last December, I had um, three weeks at home and I was um, planning a quilt to teach at the conference at Uluru next year at Earth Rock. And I started one project. No, that didn't work. Started another one. Yes, that was working, but far too time consuming for um, the girls coming to Ayers Rock. And I virtually worked for three weeks every day, didn't get very far. But right at the end, um, I came up with the technique that I'm using now in this new body of work. So you do have to give yourself time to experiment and not actually get anywhere. So that can be frustrating, mm. but um, I was so happy to be home and in the studio. <laughs> it didn't actually worry me too much. The other thing that's happened is that home is so precious and when we're home, it is like being on a holiday, being home. So I do love it. I do love being home. We live, um, we live about a kilometre back from the water on Port Phillip Bay on the side of a hill, so we do have a lovely view. And um, I can see that, you know, in the next few years, I'll just gradually cut back more and more with the teaching and uh, and we'll spend more time at home in the studio. Um, but I, you know, as I said earlier, I can see myself teaching for quite a time yet. Yeah. You, you talk about the importance of your family. So you've got three daughters and, and about nine grandchildren. Have, have you got any quilters amongst them? Well, um, our three daughters, um, the engineer come architect, no, she doesn't sew at all. I can remember going to visit her in uh, the Netherlands and her, um, her trousers would be stapled up <laughs> or uh, masking tape and she still doesn't sew at all. Um, our other two daughters have made quilts, um, but they're busy with their children now and they all work part time. Um, but I do have one granddaughter that has made quite a few quilts and she's actually even won herself a sewing machine with one of her quilts. So That's she's fantastic. very accomplished. She's uh, 14 now and in my latest book she has two quilts. So oh, fabulous. So, yeah, it's pretty terrific. Um, the granddaughter that I have staying with me at the moment is seven and when we finish this interview, she is just itching to get down here into the studio because she loves sewing on the sewing machine. Um, so my grandson, one of my grandsons has um, spent a few days sewing. He's made a, a cushion with a, uh, an applique of a car on the front. So the kids all love coming down here, painting fabric and stitching on the sewing machine with a, a box under the pedals so they can reach. So I've got hope for that generation. Yeah. Can you tell us about your studio where you create? So um, when we built this house, which was about eight years ago, um, as I said, we do look over the bay, over towards Geelong, um, and it is a very steep block being on the hill. So on the bottom level is my studio, and I really got this huge big workspace under false pretenses because... We talked about the fact that, you know, seeing we were going to live at the beach, um, I might teach from home. And uh, so I kept pushing the walls out further and further <laughs> with the architect. And, um, and I moved in and I've never taught a class and I have no intention of teaching a class <laughs> at home. I just filled it all up with, um, you know, I've got a wet area. I've got a, uh, a dedicated washing machine downstairs. I've got two sinks. I've got a bathroom. Um, I've got a lovely big uh, uh, polished concrete floor, which is fabulous in a studio. Mm -hmm. And then I've got different work areas. Um, there's a sofa bed down here. So it's the overflow for, um, you know, when family come and stay and, um, you know, big work tables and lots of shelving. So it's an absolute joy to, to be, have such a beautiful space. And I look out the window and I can see the water. So um, I'm very fortunate. And if you ever get given grief about having not taught, a, taught in that space, you can say that you have been teaching your grandchildren. Yes, that's right. So there you go. <laughs> There's your excuse. There's so, my excuse. 
Um, can you give us a brief rundown of your design process? You've, you've mentioned that you've, you sketch when you're away and travelling so that you can come back and hit the ground running. And you, you talk about experimenting with different techniques and things. But if you, if you have your technique in your head already and you've got the idea for a quilt that you want to make, so what is your design process? How would you start that? So if it's a building, I actually, um, if, it, if it's to be a, a quilt based on a, a facade, I would actually start with the photograph of that facade and I might crop it or work out which part of the building I want to use. And then I would um, get that photo copied up to size. And if it's a building, I actually trace off those lines so I get the perspective um, accurate. But all of my landscapes sort of start from maybe a, a photograph that my husband has taken, um, a photograph I've taken, and they're never exactly the same as the photograph. That's just the starting point for me. Um, I will just do little sketches. Um, I have a sort of, you know, a fair knowledge of design now as to what's important in design. And so really I'm, I'm taking photographs, I'm doing little sketches, rearranging the elements. And then when I'm happy with that, I will draw it out full size and I will have it, you know, a, a big sheets of paper up on my design wall drawn out full size. And then I will make a pattern from that out of freezer paper. Um, so, I find if I do that, then when I come and go all the time, um, I can just pick up quickly, right. and, you know, because I've got it all drawn out. And it's not that it has to stay like that, mm -hmm. but that's just sort of part of the process for me is drawing out full size because then you can see, you know, what more uh, the other details that need to be in there. But I do start off. Um, you know, with lots of little sketches in yeah. the beginning. So you, you, you really do work on a plan that you, you know pretty much where you're going right from the start. You're not designing on the wall as such. No, I do. I like to pretty well work out where I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not to say that it has to be like that. I might move things across and, and play around with things, but... Um, and, and experiment a bit more with fabric, but usually I have a plan. Usually from the you know from the beginning, yes. And you're using photographs as a lot of your inspiration, yours or your husband's, as you say, he's a talented photographer. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And um, so you know, I've got a wealth of of, of uh, inspiration here of images um, to use, and you know they don't turn out to be exactly like the photograph. I mm -hmm. might use the, the tree out of one photo or, you know, the sky out of something else and put elements together, play around with things, repeat things, but um, they're just the starting point for me as far as the landscapes go. Great. So we'll finish up because we, we're getting close to time now. If we finish up with a few sort of... Um, Slightly lighter questions. So can you tell us what aspects of making your art are your least favourite? Well, I, I was trying to, uh, to think about that one and um, I, I can't think of any part that I really don't like. Um, <laughs> I know there are times when um, then I struggle and I, you know, I can't work out how to do a foliage on a tree, for example, or something's not really working for me and I might spend a period of time where it is quite a struggle. I'll try different things. Um, one of the funny things that usually if I, I get my best inspiration when I'm in the shower mm -hmm. and oh, I'll often try and draw things on the wall of the shower as they're coming to me, you know, in the, in, in the mist or the, the fog on the side of the shower. But uh, I think if I relax, then often a, a strategy comes to me. Mm -hmm. But I do enjoy, I even enjoy the really boring parts. So if I've got to make something over and over again or I've, I've cut out a whole lot of stuff and it just needs to be stitched down, um, I'll, I'll put on an audible book and away I go. And I, I quite enjoy that as well. So... There's no part really that I don't enjoy as far as the process goes. You even confessed to enjoying ironing fabric earlier, didn't you? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and, you know, when I'm, if I'm starting on a new major project, um, it will start with once I've got an idea of the design, I will spend a day dyeing fabric uh, for that project. And that's quite exciting as well. Some of the fabric I'll use, some of it I won't. When I'm about to start a project, I will go through um, my drawers and shelves of fabric and um, pull out anything that I think might work and then put it all in another big box. And that's sort of what I go to then as I'm working on the uh, project. And then at the end, I should put all that away. I try to. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little while before that happens. But um, recently, um, I went right through all of my boxes and shelves and drawers of fabric, and I gave away more than half of it. So now it is really um, well organised and I can see everything. So uh, it's sort of much easier to find things at the moment. True confessions of a quilter, eh? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gloria, what artists or quilters inspire you? Um, as far as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I haven't been to a quilting class for, oh, my goodness, 20, 25 years because I haven't wanted to be influenced by people um, as far as, you know, then I, I'm confident that the work in my books is my own. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I enjoy, there's quite a few artists as such that I, um, I collect their books and I just keep reading, rereading them. Um, as far as artists go, um, there was an Australian artist called Howard Arkley. And he made, uh, a lot of his paintings were based on the suburbs of Melbourne. And he used um, patterns that were based on wallpaper to paint the walls of his suburban houses in Melbourne that looked like, um, I think they were wallpaper patterns, but they lend themselves to fabric as well. So I just love his work. I've been to a, an exhibition of his work um, and my husband had to drag me away at the end of that. <laughs> I, I love some of the New Zealand artists. Um, one in particular um, is Harold Coop, mm -hmm. who does those multiple images in a design. And I, I love what he does. See, I've also got like favourite um, architects that I, you know, we've got an Australian architect that has passed away now, Harry Seidler. Um, the architecture of the 50s and 60s, that sort of, you know, work that happened then, I love that. Um, another artist, the Canadian artist, the uh, Group of Seven, and in particular Tom Thompson, I love what he does with his um, landscapes. So I just, rather than, um, you know, a favourite quilt maker, it's sort of, you know, across the board. Um, as far as quilt makers go, um, I'm, I often judge at quilt shows in America and I I really respect good workmanship, be it a traditional quilt or a contemporary quilt. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's, it's some amazing work out there to inspire us. Yeah, there is. And I can see that you you, you draw from a wide range of, of um, inspiration there. So, yes, yeah. definitely. And lastly... Oh, no, not quite lastly. We'll, we'll, we'll ask you what tools or techniques or things in your studio could you not do without? Um, well, obviously my sewing machine because I, <laughs> I can't sew by hand. Um, and I, have, I, I do have a more modern Benina now than that original one that I got 40 years ago. Um, I think that the best thing, the best investment I ever made was to buy a Sew Easy table. Uh. Uh, and I actually have two of the, I bought one to take to class so I could so put my machine in the middle of the classroom mm -hmm. and I was at the, the right height. And then I was using that all the time at home. So I bought another one to take to class and then I had two machines set up at home in them. And now I've got my bigger sewing machine. I've bought their bigger model, so ah, easy table. Yeah. And for me, that is just the best thing that's helped me immensely with my sewing. So um, that I, I would say that's a product I can't do without. Yeah, and I I know Catherine who's um, who started the So Easy Table Company, and yeah, she'll be very happy to hear that because <laughs> they, oh, yeah. they are no, great. It's, it's a product that 
And I talk about them in class all over the world and I'm so excited when they pop up in class in remote places like in Scotland and, you know, up in up in a remote town in Canada somewhere. So it is a fabulous product. I do. I have one myself and, yes, I wouldn't be without it. It is great. Yeah. yeah. So um, if people want to find out what's next with you, where can they find you? Well, obviously, uh, on my website is where I'm teaching. Um, I've got next year's program on the website. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a new class that is not on the website, which is based on the body of work that I'm doing now. Um, we uh, need to sit down and, and photograph the quilts and get those on the website. It's interesting because I actually teach that class for the first time in Bristol in England in about three weeks. So... All these people enrolled in the class and they, they didn't even know what they were doing. <laughs> and, uh, that's very so, trusting. So, yeah, so so that's sort of uh, as far as classes go, that will be on my website soon. Um, I've also got a news page now on my website. Uh, I'm not really on Facebook and I don't do a lot of those other things uh, online that people do. But um, I do try and um, do a news page uh, every now and again on my website, keep that up to date. And uh, so that's, and plus my schedule is on there and my classes. So that's probably a good way to keep up with what I'm doing. So your website is www.glorialofman.com and that's Lofman spelled L-O-U-G-H-M-A-N. Yes, that's correct. And you've got a contact um page there that people can get in touch with you if they want to reach out to you yes that's right yeah. yes yeah and it is a great i'll put in a plug here for your website you've got a fabulous gallery and um you know great 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 pages there to have a browse through if anyone's wanting to find out more about you and yes i've enjoyed reading your news page which is is um especially the photographs from alaska i was looking at the the buildings the the cruise that you went on Oh, thank you. Yes. Mm. Yeah, my husband and I do have a good time, as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, Gloria, for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, it's been my absolute pleasure. And hopefully we'll catch up at Symposium next week. Yes, it'll be lovely, lovely to talk to you face to face. <laughs> You've been listening to the New Zealand Quilt Show. I'm your host, Charlotte Scott. Please visit my blog, the slightly mad quilt lady .blogspot com, for show notes for this episode and any more information you might need. Email me, the slightly mad quilt lady at gmail .com. I'd love to hear from you, so please don't be shy. And the music for this podcast is Crunk Night by Kevin McLeod of Incomputed.